Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to our uh, to St. Thomas's to our 10:30 service. Good morning to a, a crowded house this morning. It's great to see you this morning. Uh, welcome to those who are streaming online. It's good to see you too. Uh, welcome today. I can hear someone put someone putting their finger into the ear. Can you hear me? Okay. Thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. I don't suppose if you can't hear me. Okay, you can answer that question. Can you? There's, just realise the problem with that. Just a couple of notices before I hand over to David, who's leading today. Uh, first of all. Fantastic to welcome back Jeannie and Jean, who have not so Jeannie in the back row and Jean here, who have not been since March 2020, so over two years. Isn't it great to welcome them back today? <laughs> Jean Jeannie is a is a David Bowie song, isn't it? Is that right? Should we sing that as our first song? Perhaps not. Uh, and then after the service, also returning for the first time since 2020 is Coffee after the service. So yeah, fantastic. I don't know who's on coffee today, but thank you. Wave at me if you're on coffee today and helping. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Mar um, Michelle. And hi, Linda. Thank you as well. Hi, yeah. Linda's very excited about coffee. So fantastic. Pleased. So that will mean normally we've been going out the door there at the end of the service. That will now be shut as it always used to be. And so we will leave through the church hall and that door there, thereby encouraging you to stay for coffee. Um, and it means I don't have to be in two places at once. I can just stand at one place. So that door will be shut. We'll go out the side door. And then advance warning, next week is a communion service. You remember, a communion service, we always share food together. We have a meal afterwards, so bring your food. We're not quite at bring and share yet, but bring your own food, and hopefully we'll get to a point of sharing food soon as well next Sunday. I'll send an email to remind you. Over to David. Thanks, David. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all. And welcome to you if you're watching on Facebook as well. It's good to have you joining us. Um, Special welcome back to Letty as well, so I've seen nice to see Letty with us again. And uh, also Richard Marshall, who's the new chaplain at the Kings, and Ian's going to be talking to Richard later on in the service, so welcome to both of you as well. Okay, well let's prepare to worship the Lord together, shall we? Let's go ahead, remembering that we're coming for an awesome God who looks into our hearts and minds, and we need to honor and give him glory. As you know, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the books of Ro Book of Romans in our morning services, and in chapter 5, verse 10, we find these words. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been received reconciliation. So let's start our worship this morning by rejoicing with Paul in our reconciliation with God through Christ's victory over sin and death. And let's give him the glory as we stand to sing together, Christ triumphant, ever reigning.
let's remind ourselves why we gathered here this morning together to come before God and say these words together. We have come each other in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive ourselves, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we can give ourselves to the service of God. Amen. Our God, creator of the universe, sent his son Jesus to pay the price for our sin through his death. And it's astonishing to think, isn't it, that out of his sheer grace and love and mercy, he actually did do that, send Jesus, his son, to die for us. How can that possibly be that he did that? How could it be that he died for me? Let's sing together. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? take a few moments now just to reflect on God's amazing love for us Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary so please do be seated and just prepare to bring our sins and the troubles of our hearts before the Lord confess our sins in penitence of faith, resolve to keep God's commandments, to live in love and peace with all, as we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you, we've done evil in your sight, we are sorry and repent, have mercy on us according to your love, wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Find these words in Romans chapter 8. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead 
who also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now, I don't know if uh, any of you have ever been lost out in the country somewhere. You know, I can, I can remember two occasions when Sue and I had been lost. Now, the first one I can remember is on a holiday in Cyprus a few years ago. Sue and I drove out and we went for a walk. And we ended up having to get a taxi back to a car because we couldn't find it. <laughs> On another occasion, this is a bit more frightening, and is Carol Botham here? No. Well, John and Carol would remember this as well because they were with us. We went for a walk on Kinder Scout in the Peak District. We walked some of those deep pit roughs. I mean, do you know what a pit, pit rough is? It's a, it's a big... The, Kinder Scouts called in peat and they have big gruffs, big holes in the peat where the waters wash the peat away. And you walk through these and they're very deep, you can't see much out, it's all out of them. But we walked through these gruffs and we totally lost, lost our bearings. We couldn't see any landmarks at all. And I think Carol and Sue thought we were never going to get back, but here we are anyway, just to prove we did. Now, what do you think might have helped us to get out of those gruffs? What might have helped us to find our way out? Yes, Linda? A map. That's a good thing. Yeah, a map. Well, this is the, this is the actual map we used. It hasn't been used much since because we got lost. <laughs> yes, this is a map. We had one of this one. And what else? What else did somebody say? A compass. Okay. Well, I bought a compass now. <laughs> I'm going to the time. A compass. That's right. And why, why is a compass helpful? What does a compass always do? Any... Anybody know? It always, it always points to the north, doesn't it? So, you get, you know, so from that you can find out your bearings, can't you? If you know where north is, you can work out where you're going to go. Well, we've only got a map. We haven't got a compass. So the map, what do the maps do? They, what do the maps do? Pardon? They tell us where we're heading for, don't they? Yeah. So the map was showing us where we needed to go, but the compass would have pointed in the right direction. 
if we do add one. But you know, as we, as we travel through life, we also need a map and a compass as well in our lives. And you know, God has given both of those to us. He's given us this, the Bible, and that's our map on the journey through life. But sometimes we don't always understand what we see in the Bible, do we? And what we read, we don't always understand that. It's hard, you know, it gets hard to know which way we should actually go. But God knows that, He knew that. So, what do you think God did to help us to get to find our way through the Bible? Any ideas, anybody? Point to the way back. He gave it, that's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, He sent the Holy Spirit to be our guide. See, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the Bible, to understand Scripture. And it guides us in the right direction. And John, in his Gospel, said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So in our lives, we need a Bible, and we also need the Holy Spirit. And if we're friends of Jesus, if we're God's children, we've got both of those. Because he gives them to our lives. Now, perhaps you're wondering, how, how did we get off Kinder Scout without a, without a compass? <laughs> We'd only got the map. Well, you see, it was a sunny day, but like it is now. And we knew that when the sun comes up, it comes up in the east and goes to the, to the west, doesn't it? So, about midday, like it is now, the sun's pointing to the south, so we could get our directions, we could find our bearings. And we could work out where we needed to go from the, from the sun. And you know, that's a really good idea, isn't it? You know, when you're lost and confused, if you can't read the map and you don't have a compass, follow the Son. God's Son, Jesus Christ. Okay. Well, we're going to sing again now. We're going to sing, Once I was dead to you and couldn't hear. And that reminds us that we need the, need the Spirit to help us as we journey through our lives. Now, this is quite a good song for musical instruments. So, whilst the music group warm up, I'll get the instruments. Come and get one. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. 
Heavenly Father, you have given us riches beyond measure. We can only return a fraction of what we owe to you. But we ask, Lord, that you'll bless this offering, either on the plate or through the bank, and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Amen. Please do sit down. Well, at this stage, our young folk are going to leave for their own ministry of the word. So if they want to make their way to the back of church, that'll be great, and go out through the far door. And there are groups, the groups available are up there on the wall there. Don't forget to bring your instruments back. What a mess. All right. So always get the good to get the vicar working <laughs> on a Sunday. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now, as the, as the children are leaving, it's just great to welcome new friends and old friends. I'm just going to welcome an old friend. Letty is here. Letty, come on up. It's great to see Letty. Letty was, for those who don't know, was our school chaplain for two and a half years until she and Mark moved down to, I always want to say Plymouth or Portsmouth, but it's Plymouth, isn't it? It is Plymouth. Come here, come here, come here. Tell us, how's it going in Plymouth? Tell us the news. What's it like? Yeah, no, it's great. It's a completely different lifestyle. Uh, it's a complete role reversal because here it was about my job and down there it's about Mark's job. So Mark is a youth and children's pastor for, um, for a church, so um, he's got the responsibility of bringing back the youth and children's work post-COVID. Um, and I'm working in the office. Um, so you're yeah. in the church office, and you've also got a new job as a, an, an Aggie. What's an Aggie? <laughs> so I've just got a new job. I've just started for Aggie Westons. Aggie Westons is a charity that works alongside um, the chaplaincy services in the Navy. Um, so they're, they're not um, ordained ministers, but they um, offer practical care and um, pastoral care and support at those in the Navy. And hilariously, I didn't actually apply to work in the Navy. I applied to work with families, but they've, they've made me the pastoral worker uh, for Stonehouse, which is all about Royal Marine High, High Command. <laughs> so I've got to work out how to get alongside Royal Marines and... Uh, that's a new challenge. As, as you say, a change in lifestyle. <laughs> Letty, it's great to have you with us. It's great there's coffee, so we can have a chance to catch up with you afterwards. Are you going to hang on here a minute? Because we're going to get Letty and a few of us to pray for Richard, who's now going to come up. Who is, isn't this great that we have the meeting of chaplains? <laughs> so Richard is our new school chaplain. Uh, as we said a few weeks ago, amazing provision that Letty finished on the last day of half term, and then the next day of the next half term, Richard started just at the right time when we were powerless for a chaplain. Richard turned up, and he's here today with Caroline and Thomas and Miles, uh, their children. Though you live in, tell us where you live, Richard. Yeah. Uh, we live in Hartford near Northwich, and Thomas and Miles go to Hartford Church of England High School, which is a school that, like the King's Academy, transfer for, from being a normal comprehensive school high school to being a Church of England school it did it the, the year before um, we did here the, the Kings and uh, I believe Ian you you actually went over to Hartford. we did uh, me and David and Jane and a few others who were governors uh, went to have a look at the high school and me and Letty went when we started as well didn't we just to meet the chaplain there now, Letty's been a, a school chaplain and is now a, a, an armed forces chaplain. You've been a prison chaplain and a school chaplain as well, as well before, as well as a vicar. Give us a, a 30 second phrase of your whole life. Go. 29, 28. Right. Okay. Um, I was in teaching, uh, I taught at Manchester Grammar School Geography and then um, moved into uh, training for ordination at Wycliffe Hall. And during my six week summer placement between first and second year at Wycliffe Hall, I was here. So some of you who were here 25 years ago 
1997, I was actually here. Who was here in 1997? I can remember, recognize one or two faces. And um, Brian and Sue Tatsell are actually godparents to uh, our oldest Thomas. So uh, we still have a bit of a link with people who used to be around. So, um, so yeah, after finishing at Wycliffe, I did four years of curacy in inner city Salford. I then did prison chaplaincy at Strange Ways, Manchester Prison, and at Sedba School in Cumbria. I'd then done 16 years as uh, the vicar of two parishes in Blackburn, where we also got going a new primary school, um, which became one of the flagship schools in the diocese, uh, 420 students uh, in that school. And I've done some chaplaincy work at a school in Bolton as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. Now, the, the tempting question is to ask how Strange Ways prepares you to work with children at the King's, but I'm not going to ask that question. I'm going to ask you, what's your vision? Why are you a school chaplain? What do you hope to achieve? Well, I think it is an immense privilege to be able to be funded on, on this occasion by the Department of Education to work in our schools to enable students and staff to know what Christianity is really about. Not just from the RE lessons where they learn alongside other religions, but actually to see what Christian life really can be when lived out. And I think that's the challenge, to enable students and staff to actually see what it is to be a real Christian, to blow away any stereotypes or prejudices that they may have, particularly from what they see in the media, to actually meet real life Christians. Because when they do research on how people come to faith, very often it's because they know a Christian, they've met a Christian, and they ask questions. And the people are very open, perhaps in these post-COVID times, to ask questions that perhaps they're a bit more closed about before. And certainly the research that's been done most recently said that when people meet a Christian, they're quite happy to actually talk about God and eternal things. And once they've had that first conversation, something like 90% of them actually are quite happy to have a further conversation. So you begin to realize actually that if we have the courage to be able to open our mouths and say, this makes a difference in my life, to give a real life testimony, um, that can make a big difference. And so you know, that's the vision is actually to to do that alongside any other Christians who uh, get involved with the school activities, um, whether it's on the staff or uh, families who have children there or whatever. Fantastic. And what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> what are the challenges and what can we pray for you? Well, I think the challenge is, is clearly we are in a post Christian society in very many ways that people don't think that the Christian faith is fundamental to life. Generally speaking, they think of it as like a, a sort of specialist activity if people are interested in it. Like some people might be into drama, some people might be into music, some people might be into computing, and other people are into Christianity, as if it's just another sort of interest that people have. And it's actually getting it across to people this is fundamental for their eternity and for being able to live in this world with God in their lives, to live life in all its fullness. And unless they can grasp that and see it, they're not going to be the people that God created them to be. They're not going to be able to flourish and grow and be such a positive influence in this world, let alone have a hope of glory in the, in the world to come. So that's the challenge. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Letty, why don't you kick off? Come and have the microphone and pray for, for Richard. So, yeah. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you uh, for the provision of Richard just at the right time. And um, we just ask that you would bless the work that he is starting uh, we pray that he would be able to get alongside the staff and students at the school really quickly. Um, Lord, we pray uh, that you would be transforming hearts at the Kings, uh, that you would be drawing people to you, and that you would uh, use Richard as a, 
a powerful instrument uh, for your kingdom in that place. Um, and, um, yeah, Lord, I pray for um, the faithful proclamation of the gospel in the King's School. Um, I pray that you would remove any obstacles that come in Richard's path, uh, that you would give him the right words to say at the right time, um, and that you would grow his faith and his love for you as he does that work. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you want to pray? Yeah, Father God, we just uh, lift Richard to you and, and Lett as well in her roles in Plymouth, Lord. We lift them both to you and we thank you for them. And thank you, most, Lord, most of all for your faithfulness that uh, in this change of being Letty and Richard, there's been a gap and we've had to trust that you'll bring the right person forward at the right time. And we look back and we see that your hand has been in everything. And we praise and thank you for that, for your faithfulness. And uh, it's a real encouragement, Lord, to see that happening. And we, we lift Richard to you now. And we do ask you to bless his ministry, Lord, uh, at the Kings and the schools in Kids Grove, Lord. We, don't, we lift him to you, inspire him through your spirit to, as Letty said, have the right words, the right time for the pupils he meets. And Lord, let him be a, an example also, not just to the pupils, but to the staff of the Kings as well and the local schools because they need a role model to follow. We pray, Lord, that Richard will provide that model. So bless him in everything he does there, Lord. And we lift him to you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, we just commend, well, Letty to you. Thank you for Letty and Mark. Thank you for the time here, the pioneering work that Letty did here uh, in, in getting chaplaincy into the kings. Thank you for the fruit of that is, is the school uh, wanting uh, Richard, so thank you so much for all that Letty did. Please bless and encourage her and Mark down in Plymouth and uh, help them just grow into their new roles. And again, Father, for Richard, we just pray that you would protect him, uh, help him not fall into traps of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person or whatever. Help him to uh, just be bold, though, in talking of Jesus and, and, and just pray that you would fill him with your spirit and lead him in every way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we give Letty a round of applause to say, well done, thank you for all you did here, and, and see you soon. And a round of applause to welcome Richard and Caroline and Thomas and Miles. We should say, you're going to take a seat, we should say, um, we won't see tons of Richard in church because he will be going to uh, their home church in Hartford, but they'll welcome here any time. Thanks, David. Thank okay, let's bring our minds back now to the Lord and uh, to his word. In Romans 8, we read that God promises that his spirit will give life to our mortal bodies. So let, let's make this next song a prayer that the Holy Spirit will, is going to breathe life, new life into our souls and renew our hearts and cause God's word to come alive in us as we come to hear it read and expounded. Let's make this song a prayer for, the, for that. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, Breathe new life into my willing soul. Thank you. 
Please sit down and David's going to read from Romans chapter 8. It's on page 1134, if you'd like to follow it. Page 1134. Thanks, David. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. <coughs> free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in, are not in the realms of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even your body is subject to death because of sin. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we sit, we pray. Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the Bible in our hands, and please would you speak to us, into our hearts, and encourage us in our faith today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. How can I be sure that God loves me? How can you be sure that God loves you? So how does God feel about you today? When God thinks about you, when he looks at you, how does he feel? When the God of the whole universe thinks about you, does he smile or does he frown? Is there warmth and tenderness or is there, I don't know, disappointment? You know that worst thing parents say is, oh, I'm just so disappointed. Is that, is that how our Father God feels about you? When he sees your sins and your weakness and your failings, does he shake his head and put his head in his hands in despair? Can I be sure that God loves me now? And can I be sure that God will love me in the future, when my life ends, when I stand before a holy God, when he, the God who sees all and knows all and judges all, can I be sure that God will love me, love me then and welcome me with open arms? Well, of course the answer is Jesus. Of course we know if we trust Jesus, if we have faith in Jesus, he has died for us, so we are rescued. We have faith in Jesus. Many, most of us here are Christians. But even those of us who do trust Jesus, we doubt sometimes, don't we? We doubt his love. We, we need reassurance, don't we? I mean, how can he still love me when I sin, when I fall into old habits, when I do the things that I know I shouldn't, when I get frustrated with myself, when I think I should be free from this by now? The, the things I do, they're a sign, aren't they, that God is not working in me, that I'm not sorted with God. And I wonder and I worry, does God love me? We sin... And we suffer. That's the other reason that we doubt. When things happen to us, when people get ill or people die or there is heartbreak or illness or grief or whatever, we wonder, we worry, does God love me? And these chapters in Romans, we're going to look at chapters 5 to 8 in one go. These chapters in Romans are written to help us with this, to give us reassurance, to give us confidence that God loves us. Even when we sin and even when we suffer, God will always, always love us. So how can, I, how can I be sure God loves me? Well, Christ's death is my guarantee. Chapter 5, or 2, 8 actually, covers this. Christ's death is my guarantee. But start with chapter 5. How can I still know God still loves me? Well, when I suffer, when bad things happen, when I'm in pain or someone else is in pain or whatever, how can I know he still loves me? Well, if you flip back to chapter 5, just one page, back to chapter 5, page 1132. Uh, Paul has been writing about suffering in chapter 5, how Christians suffer. And can we be sure God still loves us when we suffer? Well, chapter 5, verse 5 says, and hope, hope in God, doesn't put us to shame. In other words, our hope in God doesn't embarrass us, doesn't show us up in some way. God doesn't let us down because... God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God has poured his love into us, our hearts. As Christians, we were empty and he's filled us up with our love, poured into us, filled up to the brim. From the moment we believe and trust in Jesus, he's poured his spirit into us and we're not left on our own. He's got us. He'll never let us go. Whatever we go through, he has got us. When we suffer, He's got us. We'll come back to that right at the end of the sermon. But what about my sin? What about the fact that I sin? How do I know God loves me when I sin? Imagine a mountain. Here's a mountain on the screen. And there's you climbing up the mountain. And you're halfway up the mountain and you look out and you see the view and it is stunning. And you say to your mate, oh, look at that view. It's great. The view is great. And they agree and say, oh, yeah, this view is great. It's amazing. But in a minute or an hour or whatever, you will stand on, on top of the mountain and how much more you will see. The view is great now, but on top of the mountain, how much more you will see. It is great, but how much more? Now it's great. How much more then? And that's the idea Paul wants us to grasp in chapter 5. We know something now, and what we know is great, but then how much more? How much more than we know today? So, what do we know now? What, what is it that's great? 
Well, what we've seen so far in the book of Romans, we're flying over the book of Romans. We're, we've got into a helicopter and we're flying over and seeing the view of the book of Romans. So what have we seen so far? Here's the big picture. We've seen our problem. That's what we started with a few weeks ago in chapters 1 to 3. Our problem is God is angry. Our problem is God. That God is angry at us for the mess we've made, for the sins we've done, for the ways we've fallen short, for our failure. God is angry at everyone in the world, including us. But God's solution is Jesus. Jesus makes us right with God. If God is angry at us, we are wrong, uh, wrong with God, wrong with God, but God makes us right. He justifies us. Now, we use the word justify. If I've done something wrong, if I've messed up in some way, I'll try and justify myself and say, oh, it wasn't quite that bad. I didn't quite mean it like this. I'm really sorry. We try and justify ourselves, but we never quite make it right. But God justifies us completely. He makes us right. For all that we've done that has made it wrong, it goes on to Jesus on the cross. Jesus is punished in our place, so God makes us right. We don't justify ourselves. He does that to us. He drops justification on us. He makes us justified. He makes us just. He makes us right with him. That's God's solution. Our problem is God's angry. Our solution is given us by God, Jesus' death on the cross. So Paul now, in chapters 5 to 8, wants to reassure us God's love is sure. Now, that's the view we've got so far. The view we've got so far is, oh, we can see the mess we've made, but God's solution is Jesus. That's great. Oh, it's great, the view we've got. What a great view. And Paul tells us again in chapter six, uh, 5, sorry, chapter 5, verse 6, with some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Sort of a uh, little personal moment now. Here's my favorite verses, or some of them. Verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6. You see it just at the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows us his love. He proves his love, for in verse 8, while we were still sinners. That's when he loved us, when we were still sinners. When we'd not got over our sin, when we'd not kicked the habit, when we'd not proved we were worth loving, he still loved us. While we were still sinners, he loved us so much that Christ died for us. That's what we know now. That is great, isn't it? The view is great. It's fantastic. We can be sure God loves us. His death guarantees that. Because everything you don't love about God and everything you've messed up about is taken to the cross. While we were still sinners, sin was taken to the cross. That's what we know now. It's great, isn't it? Isn't that view great? It's great, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Amen. It's great. But one day, how much more we will grasp this. One day, how much more we will experience his love. And the words how much more, the idea of how much more, comes time and again in Romans 5 to reassure us as Christians. We've got a great view, but how much more is coming. So chapter 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, that's what we know now. We have been made right, justified. God, we don't justify ourselves, he has justified us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, we're right with God. We know that now. But how much more of the view we'll see one day? He continues, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We know today, it's great today, we're forgiven now. But how much more will we see then and understand then and experience then God's love as he rescues him, us from his wrath. The same thing happens in chapter 5, uh, verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, that's what we know now. We used to be the enemies of God. We used to be, shove off God. No, keep out. This is my life. That, but we know we've been reconciled. We've been forgiven for that. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Be assured. We're rescued now. It's great now. We can see that now. How much more we will be forgiven? How much more we will be saved in the future? If we're up a mountain, the view now is great, but the future view, how much more we will see? Now, why? 
Why will we experience even more of God's love one day? Why then? Look back at my favorite verses, verse 7. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you're in Ukraine right now, how would you feel about the Russian troops? Those Russian troops that have ransacked your town, blown it into smithereens, you've lost your home, your possessions, everything. You've run for your life. You might have seen neighbors, friends, relatives die, but you've run for your life. How do you feel about the Russian soldiers? Do you feel all warm and fuzzy and loving towards them? No, not a bit. So would a Ukrainian risk their life to rescue a Roman soldier? Seems unlikely, does it? Would a Ukrainian just give up their life for a Russian soldier? Would they give themselves up and just, in love, offer themselves for a Russian soldier? No, they wouldn't, would they? But that's what God has done for us. When we were God's enemies, when we pushed him out of our lives, when we said no to God, when we opposed God, when we were not interested in God, when we hated God, we were his enemies. But that's when he loved us. That's when Jesus died for us. But so now, now he declares us right with God. Now he says we are forgiven. Now we are friends. Now we are justified. We're right with God. So how is he going to treat you in the future? Is he going to turn back on you, his friends? Is he going to turn his back on you, his friends, and reject you now? If he died for you when you were his enemies, now you're his friends and right with God. Is he now going to say, oh, I can't be bothered with you anymore. I reject you now. If he died to rescue you when you were his enemies, how much more will you be saved as his friends? Paul is saying, What's it going to be like when you meet him on the last day? Are you going to be his enemies that he dies for? No, he's already died for you. You are going to be his friends, his family, his children that run into his arms and he welcomes you with open arms. Oh, my child. How much more will we experience his love on that day? How glorious the view will be on that day as we run into our father's arms. The view of the cross now, Jesus dying for enemies, is great. It's a glorious view. But the view on that day, how much more? How much more? Christ's death is my guarantee. How can I be sure God loves me? Christ's death is my guarantee now and it will be in the future. Now, some people object to this. Some people don't like this. Some people have a problem with this. They think, if, if, you, if you're forgiven everything, we can do what you like. Perhaps you've heard that. Perhaps you've said it yourself. Paul certainly has, because he answers that. Christ's death is my guarantee, chapter 6, without encouraging sin. Christ's death is my guarantee, but it doesn't encourage me to sin. You ever played Monopoly and had a get out of jail free card? You, you know if you're Monopoly, you're going around the board. If you end up in jail, you're trapped there for three goes or whatever. But if you've got the get out of jail free card, you bring it out and go, ching, I can get straight out of jail for free. It doesn't charge me. It doesn't cost me anything. Well, the objection to Christianity now is we've got, out a, get, got a get out of judgment free card. That if I'm saved now, if I'm guaranteed my eternity with, with God now because of what Jesus has done, then I'm free to live my life as however I life, like. I can eat what I want, I can drink what I want, I can smoke what I want, I can go where I want, I can steal what I want, I can sleep with who I want, I can kill who I want. Because it's not about me. I'm not going to be judged. I have a get out of judgment free card so I can do what I want. Who cares how I live? If I'm forgiven, I'm going to get away with that. I might as well just get on with it. There's nothing to stop me. I just hand over the card at the end and say, Jesus died for me. Thank you very much. Cha-ching! Cash it in and I go to heaven forever. If I'm not judged, where's my motivation to be good? So in Paul's words, chapter 6, verse 1, what should we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. And in different words, in verse 15, 
What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means. Shall we, shall we carry on sinning because it'll give God an opportunity to be more forgiving and look more gracious and more amazing? The worse we are, the better he will look. We don't have to follow his laws. We won't be condemned. And Paul says, no way. By no means. Get away with it. Don't, absolutely not. That's nonsense. There is no way someone who's a Christian who has been forgiven will want to continue sinning. So look at chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that uh, though you used to be slaves to sin, you've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You used to be, before you were a Christian, slaves to sin. You used to hold on to your sin. The things that you liked doing, the things that were bad for you and were wrong in God's eyes, you'd cling to them and they would control you and they would trap you like an addiction. You would keep going back for more and more thinking that's where joy was found, that's where peace was found. Whatever those things were for you and you can think of them now, if you tried to escape from them, well you wouldn't want to because they were your things, but you couldn't escape from them. You were trapped, you were slaves to those things, to those actions. Do you remember that? I'm sure you do. But what Jesus has done has set us free from that. By dying on the cross, he's broken the control those things have over us. So for the first time, you can live differently. It doesn't mean that you always do, but you can. You can live differently. Jesus set us free. And we want to live differently, don't we? As Christians, we want to live differently. Verse 17 continues, oh, at the end of verse 17, sorry. You have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. This Christian message has claimed your allegiance. It's won you over. You want to obey God now, don't you? People are complaining, if you're forgiven, Christians will do whatever they want. Well, yes, we can do whatever we want, but our allegiance has changed. What we want is different. We want to be different. We want to live like God lives, uh, wants us to live. We want to follow the Bible. We want to do the things that the Bible says. We've turned to him. We want to obey him, which is why we feel bad when we mess up, because we know there are standards and, and whatnot, and we know when we mess up, we feel so bad and guilty, but praise God for Jesus, because his death means I can always come back and I can always be forgiven. He will never turn me away. Christ's death is my guarantee. Without encouraging me to sin, actually, I want to obey God. I want to be different. And also, without rejecting law, chapter 7. Here's a similar objection some people have. If we're saved by Jesus, if we have complete forgiveness, why have rules? Why have a law? Why is the Bible full of do's and don'ts? On either side of me here are the Ten Commandments, which when we had the plastering done, were taken off the wall. Well, if we're just forgiven, if we're just going to go to be with God forever, why do we put them back up? Why do we just take the Ten Commandments and hoy them out into the street or get a skip or burn them? We don't need those anymore. Why are they even in the Bible in the first place? Well, Paul's answer is, you've half understood what's going on. You've sort of understood a bit of it. We are set free from the law, we are set free from the rules, but chapter 7, verse 6, chapter 7, verse 6, but now, by dying to what once bound us, what, when Jesus died on the cross, we are freed. We're not bound, we're not slaves, we're not trapped by those things. We're not tied to the need to keep the rules and the laws. We have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written cold code. The old way was the written code, the laws, the Ten Commandments written up on walls or whatever. The new, the new way, as a Christian, as a forgiven person, is we're given the Holy Spirit. As David said earlier in the service, we're given the Holy Spirit. So the do's and don'ts are now inside us, written on our hearts. We know what right and wrong is. The Bible, as we read it, writes God's rules, God's ways, his standards on our hearts, changing us, changing our desires, changing how we want to behave, changing our behavior, changing our desires. You can see it, can't you? If you see someone genuinely become a Christian, you can see them change before your eyes. 
Or if you look back to them a few years earlier, you can see how they've changed. If you're a Christian, you can see it in yourself, can't you? There are things you do now that you didn't used to do. There are things that you used to do that you don't do now. Or you battle not to do those things. So, is the law a bad thing? Chapter 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not, by no means. Was it a mistake for God to give us the law, the Ten Commandments? No. Because we're not rejecting the law. It's not like the, the law is, is, is over there and when we turn to Jesus we reject that and say, actually, I'm going this way now. There's nothing wrong with the commandments. The problem is there's something wrong with us, seriously wrong with us. And the law can't change that. All the law does is like a, a, a bright light shining and showing you where you fall short. The law shows you that you are wrong to lie or to cheat or to steal or to get angry or whatever. But the laws, they don't change your heart. They don't change you on the inside at all, which is why we need Jesus. We need his forgiveness to forgive us the past. We need his cross to forgive us on that cross. And we need his Holy Spirit living in us to change our hearts, to change our desires, to change our motives as the law is written in our lives. See the battle. See Paul describe the battle of someone wrestling with this in chapter 7, verse 20, <clears throat> 22, over the page. Chapter 7, verse 22. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. It's written on my heart. I love God's law. I love his standards. But I see another law at work in, in me, uh, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Paul's saying he loves right and he loves wrong because he loves God. He's a, he's a Christian. He loves the Christian life. He lo would love to live a holy life. And yet the temptations are still at work. The temptations to do the wrong thing. He still sins. He still fails. He still falls short. And he hates it. He hates it when he does those things. He feels like a prisoner trapped by sin. And whenever he feels like that... He turns to Jesus, verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus helps him and encourages him. The Christian life is a battle. It's a struggle. It's a battle against our temptations not to give in. It's a battle to be better. We know the person we want to be. We can see that. It, it, somehow it's in us. We, we know what we want to be and yet we keep failing. We keep letting God down and every day is a battle. And some battles we win and we give up things and we leave them for the rest of our life. And other battles are a daily battle as we keep going back again and again and again. And friends, we can see that and think, oh, I'm hopeless and useless and God can't love me and won't want to give up on me. No, that's a healthy sign. Don't let those struggles make you think God doesn't love you, that you're not a very good Christian. Quite the opposite. If you are fighting, if you're battling, Fighting against sin, it's a sign God's spirit is in you. You want to be holy. You just know you, you fail and you're sad and you get frustrated, but you feel that God is at work in you because he's drawing you to be that different person. And when you fail, when you mess up, when you fall short, when you feel bad, come back to Jesus. Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The battle is not a sign God doesn't love you. It's a sign God does love you. It's a huge sign he is at work in your life. Be encouraged. So how can I be sure God loves me? Christ's death is my guarantee. Without encouraging me to sin, without rejecting the law, we can be sure of God's love, that we're loved forever. Chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a fantastic sentence. Please go home and learn that sentence. Get that written onto your heart and mind. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of Jesus, because you're in Jesus, you are part of, drawn into Jesus, in fellowship with Jesus, you're a Christian, God will not condemn us. God is not against us. God is not out to get us. All of our condemnation, every last bit of condemnation has been condemned in Jesus on the cross. So we are free from all his condemnation. 
There is no list that God is making. There's no record God is keeping. There's no list of all the wrongs. There's no complaints God has against you. Every last thing has been condemned on Jesus at the cross. Every last thing has been forgiven at the cross. So you are now right, right with God. If you're a Christian, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our faith is in Jesus now, that he will rescue us now and forever. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And this is true even when we suffer. Remember at the beginning we talked about how suffering can be a, a reason we think God may not love us. There's plenty of suffering in every life. We've all suffered and will suffer, won't we? Well, Paul says in chapter 8, verse 18, I consider, chapter 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. When we meet Jesus, when that day comes, when we're on the mountaintop and we see the whole view, at the end of our lives, we'll wonder what we were bothered about. The suffering that we've been through, the pain and the grief and the anxiety and the horror of life, when we stand there and compare it to Jesus, it will be nothing. It will fade away. What, what were we fussed about? That's nothing compared to this eternal glory of Jesus I now enjoy. That suffering was nothing compared to the awesome view I see of Jesus. And will be seen in us because he says that the glory will be revealed in us. When our lives are finally, the battle is over, our finally, lives are finally like Jesus, the battle is won. When we're holy like him, we will see the glory of Jesus revealed in you and me and other Christians through the ages. So we can be sure, chapter 8, verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul went through suffering. Paul had a really difficult, painful life. He was flogged and beaten and imprisoned and shipwrecked and hurt and rejected. And he went through a huge amount of suffering. But nothing separated him from God's love in Jesus. The first Christians went through horrors of persecution. They were fed to lions. They were crucified like Jesus. Their bodies, even when they were alive sometimes, were set alight so they could be torches lighting the streets. But nothing separated them from the love of of, in, of God in Christ Jesus. Whatever we suffer, if we put our faith in Jesus, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not a pandemic, not months of isolation that we hope is behind us. That couldn't separate us from the love of God in Jesus. Not any other illness or any pain or worry at someone else's ill or pain. Not cancer not dementia, not bereavement, not war, nor accident, nor anything, nor any sin that we commit. When we stick with Jesus, we can be sure. He has poured his love into our hearts so we are full of his spirit. He shows us his love on the cross. So be sure, nothing can separate us from the love of God that comes through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate with In Christ Alone. i
so much that he sent Jesus to die for us as we say the words of the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now let's turn our thoughts towards prayer and prepare to come before him, our, our creator, our maker, and just bring our hearts and minds to him and ask our Holy Spirit to fill us. And we'll sing the next song at the foot of the cross. Feel free to stand or sit for this song and make it a prayer as we sing it.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the message of the book of Romans, that anyone who believes that Jesus died for their sins is forgiven. Their sins are forgotten by you, and their relationship with you is restored. Thank you that you promise that we will not be condemned for our sins if we trust in Jesus. Help us to take this in and to live to serve you out of thankfulness. Never let us slip back into believing that we can save ourselves by obeying the law and by going to church, but secretly deciding to live our lives as we have always done. Thank you that you send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to guide us and show us how to live for you. Help us to listen to the Spirit's voice as we read the Bible and in our prayers, and help us to live for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for Diego and Sabrina Pacheco serving you in Chile. We pray for them and their colleagues as they preach the gospel in a country where many people no longer go to church, and many of those who do are Roman Catholic and rely on good works and sacraments rather than trusting in the grace that you offer through Jesus' death on the cross. Please help Diego and his 15 church co-workers as they preach to a wealthy society. 
We pray for them as they develop the replant project in Viticura. We pray that you will help them as they seek to bring those who have left the Anglican Church in that town back to you. Please equip them to preach and teach the gospel so that the church becomes strong and can eventually plant further churches. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for our own vicar, Ian. Thank you for the hard work that he puts into everything he does. Please guide him as he interprets your word for us on Sundays, as he leads assemblies at St. Thomas and St. Saviour's primary schools each week, and as he speaks at toddler group on Thursdays. Help him bring comfort to those who are sick and bereaved, showing them that you love them, supporting them through difficult times and helping them grow in their faith. Please bless him with times of rest and time with his family. Help Ian as he leads the church, helping us all to grow strong in our faith and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray once more for the King's School. We pray for the staff and children that they will all become closer to you, knowing that you offer your grace and mercy to anyone who trusts in Jesus. Thank you for Richard, our new school chaplain. Help him to rely on your Holy Spirit to guide him as he gets to know the staff and young people so that he can see the direction you want him to take as he begins his new job. Please guide the school leaders and governors as they seek to support the young people in their learning and help them grow to maturity. Help the young people to cope with the pressures of modern life and resist the temptation to be drawn into things that do not please you. We pray that every young person will know your love and your grace. And we pray also for Letty. Thank you for all that she did as she started being the first school chaplain at the King's. And thank you that you are still with Letty and Mark now uh, in their new roles. Please continue to be with them, guide and strengthen them, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Janice. Romans 8, 16, 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. I stand to sing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
We sit in a final prayer together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. May the Lord turn his face towards us and give us peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Don't forget to join us for coffee in the church hall after the service. Let's go.